Uh, welcome back, students. So today we're going to talk about price ceilings and price floors. And the main issue for us to consider is that it turns out that government policies that control prices end up generating what we would call excess supply and excess demand, or so there's going to be a surplus or a shortage in the market as a result of the price control policy. And so um, in an unregulated market, in a free market, one where there's voluntary trade, that doesn't happen. The number of buyers and sellers match up at the equilibrium price. And these price control policies prevent that from happening. Now, the question is, you know, why do governments do that? What is it about, you know, the equilibrium that's objectionable? And the primary objection is that policymakers and government officials have to grapple with the, the idea that in any system, there are going to be people that don't end up getting the good. And, and so that's what we call a rationing system when we decide who gets what in society. So the way that the market or what we call the price mechanism works is that if you're willing to pay the price, then you get the good. And there's also the issue of ability to pay. And, you know, that's, that's also something you should bear in mind. I mean, people may in some sense want the good but not be able to pay for it. And so they don't get the good. And so oftentimes you hear people say that market outcomes are unfair. And really this lecture is about um, um, pointing out that, that other ways of allocating goods, um, particularly ones that involve price control, also have issues with fairness. And, you know, fairness is really beyond the scope of what uh, most economists consider. We might um, document some forms of, of inequality in market outcomes, um, but, but our main um, approach is to say that we can measure efficiency. We know under certain conditions that markets are efficient. Now, once we get to the issue of efficiency um, through the market mechanism, we've achieved efficiency, then we can talk about redistribution. But, but um, economists generally... Um, you know, just study whether or not the outcome of a particular um, mechanism is efficient. So um, the result are what we call price ceilings and price floors. I think it's 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 especially useful to think of a price ceiling as a price cap. That seems more meaningful to me, but it's a maximum price at which a good can be sold. And our best example of, of that kind of policy in modern times is something called rent control. Um, that caps the price that a landlord can charge for the rent of an apartment. And then we also have price floors, which are, which are legal minimum prices that are sometimes enacted. And our best example there is the minimum wage law. You can't pay less than a certain amount for an hour of labor. So how do price ceilings and price floors affect market outcomes? Well. Um, there are two possible outcomes. You can have a price ceiling that's set so high, it's set far above the equilibrium price, and then nobody has to change their behavior because the equilibrium price satisfies the requirement because it's less than the price ceiling. So nothing happens in that case. We say that the price ceiling is non-binding. And um, if the price ceiling is set below the equilibrium price, then it's going to lead to a shortage and also it's binding in the sense that that buyers and sellers have to change their behavior so here's an example of a non-binding price ceiling you've got a price of three dollars per unit and you set the price ceiling at four dollars per unit and all the price ceiling says is the price has to be less than four dollars and it already is so nothing happens and in the case of a binding price ceiling then suppose the price is three dollars per unit and the government comes in and says you can't charge more than two then suddenly buyers and sellers have to change the price that they're trading at and the law of supply and the law of demand tell us that that reaction is going to be for suppliers to supply less and for buyers to want to buy more <laughs> 
So you can see in the graph illustrated that leads to a quantity demanded which is larger than the quantity supplied at the price link price and um, what we call a shortage or what we've also called excess demand. So when you have these binding price ceilings, um, and one good example is the price ceilings of the early 1970s on gasoline, you end up with quantity demanded being much larger than quantity supplied. And so you've got long lines at gas stations, and um, also it invites other types of unfairness like discrimination by sellers who are they going to sell to if they have so many customers and they can't charge a higher price so let's talk a little bit about um, what happened in the 1970s in the case of gasoline prices so in 1973 the uh, OPEC which is the old oil producing and exporting countries raise the price of crude in world oil markets and again crude is a, a major input to gasoline so higher oil prices reduce the supply of gasoline and um, economists ultimately blamed the government regulations that limited the price of oil that companies could charge um, for gasoline so really if you look at that episode in um, the the history and of of you know uh, gasoline prices you'll be able to see lots of examples of really long lines at the gas pump so you know here let's go ahead and analyze it using the tools that we've developed we have the the demand and supply for gasoline and an equilibrium price where the quantity demand is equal to the quantity supplied and then in the first case, we could have a non-binding price ceiling, and um, you know it might be that something happens, and there's a change in supply. So, for example, um, because the supply was falling because of OPEC, and then that could cause the price ceiling to become binding, and then at that point, you're going to end up generating shortages in the market as you can see between the quantity supplied and quantity demanded um, from the shifted supply curve. So that shortage means that there are gonna be people that are looking to buy gas at the price ceiling price, which is the effective price in the market, who can't find any gas to buy. And that's exactly what happened in the 1970s. And here's another example of uh, price ceiling um, and issues that price ceilings have caused by generating shortages. So rent controls are price ceilings placed on rents um, that landlords can charge their tenants, so a maximum uh, amount of rent. And the goal of the rent control policy is to help people who can't otherwise afford housing. But um, economists have, have you know, roundly and widely criticized um, standard rent control policies. And one economist actually said it's the best way to destroy a city other than bombing. But let's kind of see exactly um, what the analysis um, tells us and why that comment by the economist might be actually a good one. So a lot of people think that the supply of rental housing is fixed. And it's true in the short run it is fixed. Um, if you think about it, right now at this moment, there are so many apartments out there. And if something was to happen to change the price, what could the landlords do um, if there was a sudden drop in, in, in rental prices? Well, they couldn't change the number of apartments for rent. So if you look at that kind of a situation and you look at rent control, then you end up getting the same um, quantity of housing before and people are paying less. Now, sure, there's a shortage um, because more people want to rent at that lower rent controlled price than can find apartments, but you haven't caused anybody to become homeless, right? It's just the people that are renting are able to rent at a lower price than they were before. Hopefully you guys can see where the demand and supply curves cross is the original equilibrium price of, of renting. Now, in the long run, the situation is different because 
you have a demand, but in the long run, um, oftentimes there are alternatives for landlords besides having apartments for rent. They could change the apartments into condos and sell them off. They could tear down the building if they weren't collecting enough in rent and change it into a mall or a strip mall or something else. So there are lots of alternatives, and not only that, but in the long run, they could decide that because rental housing is so cheap because of the rent control policies, they don't want to build anymore. So instead of having this short-run supply curve that's vertical or what we call perfectly inelastic, in the long run, landlords can change their supply decisions. But the thing to note is Again, at the equilibrium, in the long run, there's a balance between supply and demand where demand and supply cross. But if you introduce rent control in this long run diagram, then the shortage is much larger. And, and landlords typically find ways um, to cut back on their supply of housing. And sometimes what they do also, which you might not think of, you know, and you might think an apartment is an apartment is an apartment. But historically what happened was instead of um, actually reducing the number of apartments for rent, a lot of times what landlords did is they would just reduce the amenities. So if it was a rent-controlled apartment, they wouldn't show up, you know, if there was a problem with the plumbing and the electricity. They would try to encourage the, the renter to handle it on their own. And if the renter said something like, well, you know, you're supposed to come fix, you know, the apartment, I'm paying my rent, then a lot of times the landlords would just say, well, if you don't like it, move out. Because there's a shortage. The landlord knew that there were lots of other people who were willing to rent the apartment. So it really caused a decline in the quality of the rental housing available in a lot of cities that first tried these rent control policies. And that's the reason why The Economist said it was like dropping a bomb, because you would have all of these rundown um, housing units in um, New York and Chicago and places that tried this type of, of rent control. Okay, so, so um, from here, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about the other type of, of price control policy, which is price floors. So we'll save that for the next um, video. Okay, thanks a lot.